Okay, so welcome to the Imperialism in India video to help you prepare for tomorrow's class and the eventual trials on imperialism. But I wanted to start with this picture of a British official. It's a little later than where we're going to start in the lecture here, but it's the early 1900s. You have a British official sitting back and getting a pedicure by his Indian servants. And the question is, how did it come to be this way? How did a minority of British can, uh, you know, rule over a, uh, you know, millions of, of Indians? And ultimately, you're going to post uh, an answer to more or less this question form of this question. What do you think were the three biggest turning points in Indian colonial history? That's what you're going to keep an eye for. Maybe have a pencil out and kind of jot some possible answers down as we go through this and pause the video because <clears throat> you want to be able to give me three things and your reasons why you think those were big turning points. So one way to think of the turning points is to think of what was were points where there was stuff one way before that and then after the event something things were totally different that's, that's a way to kind of keep in mind of turning points in history so in in british india you have what's not actually a british colony it's actually a colony of the british east india company which is a private corporation centered in in, india, in england um and as you see they they work with um you know, they, they don't control tons of area by 1805 they begin to gain more territory their territory is in the pink the british east india company and the british east india company is a company that has the power to tax it has the power to raise armies uh, and it it's almost has governmental powers uh, and it operates for profit uh, like any little company but they can own land they can tax land they can sign treaties and they are very similar to the uh, to a government <clears throat> So to be clear, the pink zones are areas under the control of the British East India Company, but not actually England. And they, by the 1850s, you can see that pink area, they control more and more uh, land. So they, by, as the 19th century war is on, uh, the British control, the British East India control uh, is larger and larger. Uh, and one other key factor we should know by this is that there's a small amount of British officials from the East India Company, but number of uh, people called sepoys. Now, these sepoys are Indian soldiers who work for the British East India Company. They got a job with this company. Um, and they're, they're, they're armies, they're soldiers. So to remind you, this company is fairly powerful. It can actually hire its own soldiers. And these sepoys, there were about 300,000 of them uh, by the 1800s that are working for the, the British East India Company. So you got this British East India Company making profit off India, and they are using um, soldiers to kind of defend their land and even go abroad where else uh, where other places where the East India Company does business um, but in 1857 uh, a pretty big event happens what's known as the Indian Mutiny or Sepoy Rebellion depending on where you read it uh, breaks out and we're going to spend a lot of class time tomorrow figuring out why this happened because it's a fairly significant event uh, and we'll talk about why now the causes are debated and you guys are ultimately going to decide that but some argue that the British were trying to impose Christianity on the Hindus and Muslims these the sepoys and they were insulted or they favored European customs at the expense of Indian customs or there was just plain old mistreatment of sepoys uh, whatever the case was the sepoys rose up and they uh, massacred British men women and children uh, throughout various provinces in India England is understandably shocked by this and and uh, upset about this. They call it an act of terrorism against their people. <clears throat> and the British respond fairly quickly by sending more troops and brutally suppressing the uprising. And they end up killing thousands of unarmed Indians. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty nasty episode that leaves a legacy of bitterness as the 1860s wear on. And um, the British, th and this is what makes it sort of significant here, the British decide at this point that the East India Company no longer can really control India, and they send a viceroy or a royal governor, a British royal governor, to rule India. And in India now, in 1858, becomes a, a royal uh, possession of the, of, the, of the crown. And now, for example, the Queen of England is, is the Queen of England, Empress of India, and it becomes a royal colony. And the East India Company no longer runs it anymore. Uh, and so you now have the British government in control of India from the 1860s onward. And as the, the rest of the century wears on, you continue to have tensions, and this is important to know, uh, between Hindus and Muslims living in India. Um, the British see India as a good source of raw materials because it's by this point in the 1870s and 1880s when the British use it as a market, India as a market, to sell their cheap um, manufactured goods, which undercuts or puts a lot of the British, I'm sorry, the Indian businesses out of business. And 
and those people then have to go find jobs. They find those jobs in uh, farming and agriculture. So this is a key point that India actually de-industrializes during this point and becomes a supply chain basically for the British. And they also are a useful market to buy British goods. Uh, so, you know, the colony was used to profit the British at the expense of the Indians. Um, not surprisingly, you have sp sporadic uprisings and attacks, what are often called terrorism, against British targets in India, not, not in England, but in India. Um, and uh, this continues until as we get to World War I, the Indian nationalists who are calling for independence actually say, let's kind of have a truce here, let's support Britain during their war, uh, and, you know, perhaps we'll be favored, and they hope for independence. And we've already heard this before in other videos. Um, and the British response saying, yeah, you help us out, we'll promise you eventual self-rule. And you can see where that's sort of a, a wide open term there, but we'll eventually give you self-rule, whatever that means. And uh, so the war ends, and as the teens turn to the 20s and 30s, we continue to have unrest and problems in India, uh, British India. Hindus and Muslims actually continue to really, as they talk about independence, they continue to mistrust each other. The Muslims are a bit nervous because they are a minority. There are a, bit, a lot of them, but they're a minority still, and they're afraid that they might get run roughshod, or their needs will be ignored in a Hindu-majority country. Uh, the British, kind of using this tension between the two groups, uh, say, we, well, we can't withdraw because if we do, you know, there'll be, who's going to keep the peace? We're here to sort of keep order in your country. Um, the nationalists in India don't buy this, and they continue to push for uh, freedom. Uh, there's protests, there's attacks, there's uh, bombings of trains in England, I'm sorry, in, in India, but British trains in India, and uh, the British begin to arrest key nationalists, including Mahatma Gandhi, who we'll talk about a little bit later. They pass something called the Anti-Terrorism Bill, which you know, is against terrorism, but it's also against a lot of rights, limits a lot of rights of Indians. For example, the right to meet in a public square, like any kind of protest or march is banned. And the British um, uh, hope this is going to put a squash on a lot of the unrest in India and maybe help them control India further. However, the Indian nationalists take this, and in the Amritsar incident, what becomes known as the Amritsar incident, you have uh, uh, this area in kind of northern India, it's, it's sort of near the, pa the current Pakistani-Indian border, you have uh, a hotbed, this was a hotbed of anti-British uh, sentiment, and 10,000 or so protesters meet in this main square in this town called Amritsar, and it's a pretty significant town because there's this golden temple, it's a pretty big uh, icon for us. Uh, Sikhs, which is a, is a version of Islam, a branch of Islam. Um, and so thousands go to this, uh, this uh, square. And the British say, this, you're breaking the law. We said no meetings. And so they send troops to blockade the exit, and they begin to open fire on the crowds. Um, 400 are, are killed and about 1,200 are wounded. And uh, this leads to obviously a lot of anger and shock, not only actually among Indians, but uh, among the world. They were kind of shocked by the British uh, violence in the situation because there was no even pretense of them, you know, being violent. Um, Amritsar was an area where there was a lot of hostility against the British, so soldiers there might have been on edge. But this particular incident saw no fighting against the um, the uh the the british here and this was men women and children uh babies i mean there's all most sources say that this is just a, a bloodbath um the image you see here is not actual footage obviously this is from a, a 1986 movie called gandhi uh based on uh, a book called gandhi and uh wonderful stuff ben kingsley plays uh, gandhi good movie check it out um but this Amritsar incident unites any kind of semblance of, of the independence movement. Any differences they had, they're now united. We need to get rid of the British. They're no longer, there's no more moral authority with them. Um, in you, into the foray, you really see a much more uh, aggressive stance from Mahatmas Gandhi. You may have heard of this guy. Um, he's a Bridget, British educated lawyer. He's born in India, goes to Britain though, to become a lawyer. Um, and he actually moves to South Africa, which uh, is a British colony at the time. And there's a sizable Indian population there of, of immigrants. Um, but he faces injustice there, and he actually uses his nonviolent tactics, which he becomes famous for in South Africa. Uh, he then returns home to India after World War I, and uh, he becomes one of the key leaders in the nationalist movement in India. Uh, in addition to independence, he also preached and sought cooperation between Hindus and Muslims, very important. In fact, he said if Hindus and Muslims can't find peace with each other, they do not deserve independence, nor can they handle it. So he was very critical of their own, his own people and their own imperfections, as well as the British. Um, he's known as being a pacifist, but we should be clear, this doesn't mean he's just going to allow anything to happen. He, he just rejects violence as a way to achieve goals.
Um, and his, his way he achieves goals is something uh, rooted in Hinduism called Satyagraha, which is called, roughly translates to soul or truth force. Uh, and the idea is, is that truth will always be victorious over evil and tyranny. Uh, you just need to expose this. And so if you expose the truth to your enemies, you can convert them to your cause. Um, and you do this by nonviolent resistance. So you resist, but you resist nonviolently. And we're going to see how this plays out in a, a, a few key events. Uh, it involves a great deal of just non-cooperation with the authorities. Um, and this is risky, of course, because you could get shot at and, and violence can be used against you. And Gandhi's answer to that would, well, if we use violence, we will also be met with violence. So it's equally as dangerous. Um, and so the first example of this is Gandhi's boycott of British goods and what's called the spinning wheel movement. So let's keep some things in mind. England is an industrial powerhouse. They are producing textiles and they use India as a source of cheap raw materials for this and also a market for British goods to sell goods. Indians over the course of time, as you know, become dependent on British cloth um, and the companies in Britain profit handsomely from it. So what Gandhi says is, this is a key reason they're here, let's, let's attack this. And what he does is he says, we're not going to buy, we're going to boycott, refuse to buy British goods. And in fact, we're going to go burn any kind of British cloth we do own. We're going to go in public spectacles, we're going to burn it in the center of town, and we're going to show we don't need them. Um, and then he encourages Indians to use the traditional spinning wheel to make their own traditional cloth. And these were the, the methods that the, the English, you know, years before had kind of undercut and put out of business. What this does is, is it boosts national pride. We don't need the English anymore. And it also hits England where it hurts in an effort to kind of push them out of England, uh, India. Um, and this is, uh, this is not really disobedience. It's just an active defiance in, in national pride. Um, where we get the more aggressive disobedience is coming up. Now, civil disobedience is the idea of a refusal to obey an unjust law. Um, you see a law is unjust, you use nonviolent means to just not cooperate. You just you don't fight with force, you just don't cooperate with what the law is if you think the law is unjust. Um, you just, you know, it's what he called non cooperation. And uh, the first major example of this is the Salt March, and it's a very critical moment in, in, in Indian history. You have the British, just keep in mind, the British have a monopoly on salt. Um, you had to go to the British interest to buy your salt. And it was illegal for Indians to process this or make their own salt. And you're like, okay, salt, whatever, what does that mean? The significance is in a tropical climate, everyone needs salt. You lose a lot in a sweat and you need salt to survive. And, um, you know, in India, the coastal areas were actually abundant with it, and, but it was illegal for Indians to, har to harvest it. Now, uh, and, and the, one British official was very open about this. He was a British viceroy in the 1930s. He said, everyone in India needs salt. It's not a significant source of revenue for us or money, but our control over it is our control on the pulse of India. It's just one way in which they control it. Gandhi knew this, and he says, look, we're, we're going to disobey this unjust law. So Gandhi leads a march from the center of India, or about 240 miles, to these salt flats. Uh, he calls the New York Times, the London Times, he calls every major news outlet he can, uh, and he gives speeches along the way on this march, and he deliberately breaks the law by gathering salt. And he does it right in public, and he wants as many people to see this as possible. Um, and marchers are practicing non-violent here. They're, just, they're literally just gathering salt. That's it. Nothing violent. Uh, and he knows he's breaking the law. Um, and what he's doing here is he stops along the way to make nationalist speeches and validifying the, the this is the unjust nature of this. Um, and when he gets there, uh, they start harvesting salt. And these peaceful, peaceful marchers are, are met with violence. For a few days, the British are like, just ignore it. Let, him do, let us get his salt. But when he, as he got salt, the whole world was like, hey, I guess British doesn't, the British don't control India anymore, Gandhi does. So he says, we must put a stop to this, and eventually they use force to stop the, um, the gathering of salt. Uh, in one case, up in Peshawar, which is up in the north, which is actually Pakistan now, um, I believe, um, a machine gun, uh, one of the uh, military officers opens up with machine guns on guys just grabbing salt. Um, but they don't fight back. Amazingly, the British, uh, the Indians, I'm sorry, don't fight back. And the press around the world sees this and reports out on how brutal India is to these peaceful marchers really changes public opinion. England basically invites Gandhi to the Viceroy's palace and says, look it, please come to India, we gotta talk. And um, the British, um, by the way, British workers meet him and he's there, they love him. And, he, and Gandhi has, is very popular among the English population. You'd think that British workers, you know, the textile workers wouldn't like him. He visits textile factories and says, hey, my fight's not with you guys, we just want freedom. Uh, and the workers love him. Um, and the British offer him limited self-rule, not him, India, uh, limited self-rule. Uh, by 1947, this actually means full independence. Uh, and Gandhi is very, very, you'd think he'd be happy, but he's actually very upset because 
um, the Muslims begin to raise their voice that they are, they don't feel safe in a Hindu Muslim I'm sorry Hindu majority country, and so uh, the uh, Muhammad Jinnah, who is the leader of the Muslim nationalists, uh, as well as um, the British Lord Mountbatten, the last Viceroy, they instead of working out a deal, they just decide to split uh, India into a Muslim Pakistan. You can see these here, and a Hindu India. And what happens is as the Muslims are leaving India, and the, pa and the, the uh, sorry, Hindus are leaving Pakistan for their Hindu India. Violence erupts between them, and hundreds of thousands get killed in fighting. Uh, that sort of pent up tensions over generations. Gandhi goes on a hunger strike and nearly dies, and says, "I am not going to eat until this, this, we get peace here." It actually works. Many people are upset. Uh, they love Gandhi. They stop. Um, and in fact, what ends up happening, though, tragically, is despite getting freedom and eventually causing people to stop fighting, a, a Hindu nationalist, a radical Hindu nationalist who's mad at Gandhi for being too nice to the Muslims, uh, goes up to Gandhi, uh, bows to him like he's a fan, pulls out a gun and shoots him and kills Gandhi. Gandhi's assassinated in 1947 by a Hindu radical. Um, and, and it's sad because Gandhi feels he died a failure. Um, and I'll, you know, you can be the judges of that. Um, but um, he was hoping to have all of India united. But uh, India, Pakistan go on. There's tensions to this day between Hin uh, India and Pakistan. They both have nuclear weapons, so that's great. And um, you know, I'll let you guys interpret that in your trials for the rest of the of the century. But that is, in a nutshell, how the British came to control and then eventually quit India. Don't forget your post. What do you think were the three biggest turning points in Indian colonial history? Good luck.